A friend recently told me that in order to make the world a better place, Shakespeare once wrote, first of all, let's kill all the lawyers. And if he was alive today, he probably would have said the same thing about venture capitalists. My name is Nunu, and I'm a venture capitalist. We in venture capitalists have gone through a couple of really rough years, from controversies around Me Too, to frauds done by a couple of funds in the US, well-known funds, to a variety of other issues that basically have made the industry look very aloof, certainly not diverse. And more than not diverse, an industry that basically is missing on the connection to its entrepreneurs, seen as elitist and somehow a little bit out of touch. Today, I hope to convince you that there's no need to kill anyone, that I actually have some disagreements on how the venture capital profession is seen. I will share with you at least one or two tidbits that will show you that actually we're not the bad guys. We're actually very similar to entrepreneurs, and we actually go through our own rough times as entrepreneurs often do as well. So today I hope to show you that the pursuit of growth is really the ultimate aim that we should have to make the world a better place. I'll go one step further. The pursuit of growth actually is one of the key things that you need to take into account to be successful entrepreneurs, successful in your corporate roles, successful in your government roles, successful in your own personal life. Secondly, I'll talk about rejection. And it's always difficult to talk about rejection because rejection is painful. Rejection is sometimes even traumatic. But I will tell you that actually rejection can be used for the good. And when rejection can be used for the good, you'll come out of it much stronger. It's almost like propelling you forward. It's helping you become better, faster. I'll tell you my own story today, my own trauma, my own difficulties, and how I surpassed them. And I will show you that actually, I had a very dark year, 2017, and that very dark year allowed me to become better faster. Now, normally these size for presentations, you go through problems and structuring, and problems and structuring, and problems and structuring, and there's nothing at the end. There's no so what, there's no how to. I will leave you with how to's today. I will also share, as I said, my own personal life because I think it's helpful to understand that there's very micro things you can do in order to move forward. First, let's start with why growth actually matters. Now, Professor Leggett and Professor Dweg in 1988 did a seminal article that I recommend you guys read if you have a lot of patience called Social Cognitive Approach to um, basically, I always get confused around the name, Social Cognitive Approach to mindset and personality, it goes like that. It's actually a mouthful. And it's a mouthful, but in effect, the only thing you need to take out of it is it basically started in some ways the growth mindset piece. What the growth mindset piece and movement define is that if you actually work and work on efforts to become better all the time, you work on the effect of becoming a better person, you learn about a specific area, etc., you'll always outperform or on average outperform someone who is relying on their innate fixed mindset, which is basically their intellect, their skills, their circumstances. And this is actually very powerful because there have been numerous studies that now show that on average, basically people that are, go through reinforcement learning around the growth mindset outperform people that are focused on fixed mindset. You may have heard about this from other articles talking, for example, about the education of children. In the education of children, it often is talked about the reward system, what rewards you give kids. And when kids are rewarded for effort, they often outperform the kids that are actually rewarded for the fact that they're very intelligent. Or well, Mr. This and Mr. That is very intelligent, or you are very intelligent, John, actually underperforms, do you have done very, very well. So if anything you want to take away from the part around growth today, take away that. If you and your teams focus on actually basically rewarding the growth piece, the effort, at the end of the day, that will be much more powerful than just rewarding people because they're very intelligent. Now, there are other reasons why growth matters. The world has become very difficult. You're now competing globally. You're not just competing regionally within your own companies. You're competing sometimes with people that you don't even know that you're competing against, right? You know, people that are developers, they submit stuff on GitHub and they're competing with people that are all around the world that maybe they haven't even heard about. 
So there is an element of that that I think is pretty important. I myself have been a big proponent of the growth mindset. It's helped me a lot in my own career. It's helped me in moving forward. There's actually this song from Rage Against the Machine, Bullet in the Head. And at a certain point, they say something like, they say jump and you say how high. And for me, that actually has a very specific meaning. It basically defines that there's a threshold. There's a threshold that I need to move forward to. If someone tells me, you're going to need to jump, I'm going to just say, how high. I'm going to outperform what I'm asked to do. Now, for those here in the audience that actually know Rage Against the Machine and know that particular song, you know that's not what they mean, actually, by that line. But I'm not very good at lyrics, and actually I used that as a motto for the last 20 years only to realize that it, actually that's not what they meant at all. But anyway, it works for me. So, a little bit moving forward, um, I've built an entire career on adaptability. I've lived in over 35 countries, Europe, Asia, and the US. I've been a product manager, an engineer, an operator, but nothing really quite prepared me for being an entrepreneur in venture capital. And actually more than that, nothing quite prepared me for 2017. So let's go on to this miserable year of 2017. In 2017, I turned 40. And that's, as many of you know, typically midlife crisis time. In my case, it was a little bit more than that. I had an event that uh, was so traumatic that still to this day, I can't talk about it in public. Um, I was going through a divorce. Uh, the partnership that I was working for actually decided to move me to a role that was lateral and effectively a part-time role. If that wasn't quite enough, you know, I was now starting to look for my next thing, only to get a lot of no's or maybes or indifference. Indifference is the worst thing, and I think entrepreneurs understand that very well. Indifference is worse than no. And worst of all, I was drinking more and more. I, I was never a very heavy drinker, but I, I was becoming, you know, in some ways encapsulated a little bit more around my drinking. And I, I felt it was affecting me, and it was affecting how I was looking at the world. So here we have what is typically called a crisis, potentially a tragedy. But I got very lucky in 2017. Two things happened. Two actual small things. Two triggers. The first trigger happened to me while I had just come out of another no-call, as I started calling them. I was talking to a venture capital firm, and they said, you're great, you're way too senior, there's no way, we don't have a role for you. You know, venture capital is this thing, it's very top and it's very bottom, there's very little in the middle, and it's like, you're way too senior, we don't have a general partnership role for you. And I decided that, you know, I needed some inspiration, I needed to look at nature and, and just, you know, relax. Um, I'm very blessed, I live next to the ocean. And so I decided I will just look outside. And that day, it was just truly glorious. It was sunny. It was California. I mean, it's basically the postcard picture of California. And as I was looking outside, I felt sad. And I felt depressed. And at that point in time, something happened. I mean, it was actually a very simple moment. I was sad and depressed, and, and there was this issue. I was like, but I should be happy. I mean, I'm just looking at something beautiful. Why can't I dwell in this beauty and how it's done? And so that's basically when I had the moment of clarity. I had this great moment of clarity of realizing I'm getting more and more depressed. I'm getting less and less happy. Um, but there's actually nothing factually wrong with my life, in effect, right? And, and there's something that I need to do about this. I'm questioning my self-worth, I'm questioning my achievements, I'm looking at other people for feedback, I'm comparing myself to other people and their achievements. There's something that I need to do to come out of this. And so that was the moment with all my heart and my brain that I decided I was going to do this and come out of this in the only way I knew how, I was going to hack myself. Hell no, this was not my story. My story was not going to be like that. Then there was a second trigger, a simple call. Remember I told you earlier I was part of a partnership, I'd moved to a part-time role, and then there was another call where I was being asked to do another thing, and that was the moment where I decided to cut clean and decided to move on. It's very interesting again because, again, it starts with rejection. It starts with a conversation with someone where the partner that I was talking to, effectively, and to paraphrase, just turned to me and said, we were renegotiating my package. It's my way or the highway. And that was a catalyst for me. I'm very glad that he said that, because I took the highway. And so, how did I hack myself? 
Well, I hacked myself by doing very simple things. I started reading. There's a bunch of incredible books that you should read. The How of Happiness, Stumbling on Happiness. There's a bunch of books on inner peace that are fantastic. I'm Catholic, I'm a practicing Catholic. I go to Mass on Sundays, I went to God. So basically started you know, praying more often, going to Mass during the week, which in Silicon Valley, I can assure you, is not a normal thing by any means. If you've watched the show, definitely not. And so at the end of the day, I basically went through that and I went through a bunch of other things. I looked for intentional activities. Uh, Sonia Lyobimirsky, in her book, How of Happiness, talks about intentional activities, activities that you know can make you happier. I started doing things I hadn't done before, hiking and cycling, etc. And the last thing, it's probably the most important piece, is I slowed myself down. I basically started taking more time to be with people that I enjoyed being with, with entrepreneurs that I appreciate the conversations with. I started enjoying simple things, more in the moment, more aware, stronger. For me, this was a moment that in some ways defined how I decided to move forward. It decided that I was going to be a person that was very different from the past. Now, we all know that at the end of the day, rejection always lurks there. And how do you deal with rejection? So my thesis is very simple. <clears throat> rejection is a fall. And what I imagine at the end of that fall is a trampoline. There's a trampoline that if you hit it just, just right, will propel you back upwards. It will propel you to actually not just where you were before, but maybe even higher than you were before. So that's how I look at rejection, how rejection seems to me to be this incredible catalyst for change. It's almost like it's a wall, a wall that you go through, but that you know you can go through. It's almost like Cortes's order to his troops to burn the chips. There's no way back. There's only a way forward. And you know that what I'm saying is actually true because you have examples of this around the world. You have companies that wouldn't have been created if there wasn't rejection behind it. Look at Brian Acton, a guy that gets rejected by Twitter and by Facebook. He tweeted on both for some reason, not sure why. But he got rejected by two companies. He ended up creating WhatsApp. Now, Facebook paid dearly for that rejection, right? That was an expensive rejection in some ways. I'm not sure you would have done it if you went to Facebook. So in some ways, you know, we got in the world a better messaging tool. But I would go one step further than that. You guys know this is true because it's probably happening in your life. You've had moments where you had rejection onto you. You lost a job, you didn't get the resources you needed to do something in your company, you didn't get funding, but somehow it was okay. You move forward from that. So I wanted to leave you with hacks so that you can understand that this is all possible. There's a lot of things that can be done. And so to my hacks. The first one is actually rejection is mostly not personal. Rejection happens because maybe a VC is looking at you and you don't fit their thesis, or you don't fit you know, their notion of product market fit, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually not personal at all. Secondly, stop comparing yourself to others. I mean, we relativize ourselves all the time. We're always looking at others and saying they're doing better than me. We don't know other pains and what they're going through. Come back to yourself. Come back to who you are and what you have achieved. Your self-worth is not up for debate. Your self-worth is yours and yours alone. Fourthly, be neutral in evaluating situations. There's a lot of biases in today's world. You look at someone, you have an interaction with people, and basically you assume certain aspects, normally negative ones, about what they're telling you. You know, avoid, avoid these things. You know, there's fundamental attribution error, there's a variety of other things out there. Just avoid them, you don't need to deal with that. Fifth, control drinking and alcohol. Um, this is a controversial one, but my view is that alcohol can be consumed socially, but it has certainly effects on people and effects on their mindset. Actually, it is proven neurologically that if alcohol is consumed systematically, it is actually a depressive. It overstimulates your brain at a certain point in time, you do get depressed after you drink. So just be aware of that. Be cautious when you, when you deal with it. Try to find true norths. This is really difficult in today's world. Try to find things that really help you looking up to. 
It might be mentors. In my case, I had certainly a few incredible mentors. Not all my mentors were helpful during the bad times, but some of them were. Go to your closest friends. The great thing is when you're falling, you sort of realize who your friends are. It's actually one of the advantages that you have when you fall. If you're religious, God is obviously an, a very clear choice on North, so you know, that's an easy one. I always make the joke that as a Catholic, we have that unfair advantage because we just sort of have one. It's like, that's great. That's the truth. But there's a couple of people that really can help you. It could be your family. It could be a variety of other people. But having that sense of true North, of what you're doing this, it could be your family, like your coastal family, your wife, your kids. I think that's actually very, very important. Slow down. I... All my life I've been running, and it got to a point, I'm still running, but I, I basically came to the conclusion that you don't need to always run. You can actually take your time, and that avoids fear, it avoids anxiety, it avoids a variety of other issues that you need to deal with. So my view is, if you slow down, if you're more aware, more in the moment, you'll find the ultimate hack. The ultimate hack is inner peace. The ultimate hack is inner peace, is when you're just calm and you see everything clearly. You're very neutral emotionally. You probably have felt people around you, have met people like you around you. I was not like that, I'm still not like that all the time. But I have felt that, I've met people that have this, and this is incredible, it's very powerful in business, it's really powerful in the startup world, it's really powerful in government, it's really amazing. Finally, share and be vulnerable. I'm sure you guys have heard of Brené Brown, She's spoken very eloquently about this. She's actually done you know, amazing things around it. Uh, you know, her scientific research of the last 20 years is exceptional. I actually think the term vulnerable is a bit of an issue. I think vulnerability is really not a tool. Vulnerability is more of an outcome of authenticity and sharing. But I recommend to all of you that you should share. Share with people that you're really comfortable sharing with, the people that really feel that you can be of help to them. And my view is that if you start sharing enough in your teams, in your work, in your startup environment, in your corporate environment, in your family, etc., you'll get to a point where people will become more productive, they'll become better, they'll understand what's asked from them, you'll have a stronger culture around you. But actually, you can go beyond that. You can create little movements around you. You can actually get people to become less angry, more even keeled. And actually, that might be, in the end, the key to a better world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, thank you, so I have to go on this side. Thank you very much for sharing all these insights. Unfortunately, time has progressed so much that we won't have a Q&A with you. However, I'm assuming you'll be around. I will. And I'm assuming if some of them are interested to talk with you, you're open for that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.